All right, class, welcome to Thursday. We're going to start module two. Um, I made a couple com comments before the recording began, but I would encourage you guys um, to not, not get discouraged if your first exam didn't go as well as you wanted. You have a lot of time to make up these points. Um, and as usual, I'll try to work through the lecture PowerPoints and give you kind of study tips or hints along as we go. Um, in module one, um, I still am working through grading your case study posts. And the case study posts are a great way to get free points as long as you do the case study, do 150 words, a couple of you were a little short, um, and reply to two classmates, include a citation. Those are 30 easy points um, every module that you guys can get. Um, so I'm working on grading those. I'll try to have those done by this weekend. So by the end of this week, you should have a good idea of what your grade is. And again, if it's not quite what you want yet, don't freak out. We have a lot of a lot of uh, things to do until the end of the semester. I've included the physiology workshop information and schedule up here at the top, just as a reminder that you need to complete three of these by December 18th. Um, the, each one is worth 10 points. You can go to the live session or you can complete the handout and mail the handout to the MDSC. Those handouts aren't really graded for corrected, for corrected answers. They're more graded for completion but I would try to get as much as you can out of those workshops as possible because they'll help you with the content. And usually they line up with some of the um, topics that we're going over. Um, so the only other thing I wanna mention is in this module coming up, we have the nervous system and no one likes the nervous system because it has a lot of information in it. And a lot of these PowerPoints are really long and I've broken them, some of them down into two parts. Um, we're going to do chapter nine tonight. And if for some reason, I, I don't think we're going to be able to fit in all of this in the 45 minutes or hour that I want to keep you guys or do my recording. So what we might do for this module is we're still going to meet every Tuesday, Thursday for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but for example, for tonight, if we can't get through all chapter nine, I'm probably going to do a recorded lecture and post that to our class YouTube channel. Um, to kind of finish up chapter nine, just so by next week, we can start chapter 11. So that's the plan for that. Our class YouTube channel, again, the link is shown right here with the recorded classes there. And the only other thing, so in module two, um, you'll have a lecture quiz on these chapters that'll open up um, the week before October 10th. Uh, you will have some labs, I think, every week this module. And the first lab is on muscle tissue doing lobster, and this will be really helpful to review some of the anatomy of muscles, which is in chapter nine. And then this lab talks about muscle contraction, and that's a big one that you guys will be tested on in your lecture exam, the, the steps of muscle contraction. And this is due by this Sunday. So this is your only assignment due this Sunday is to get this lab done. And then next week, we have our first Physio X lab. So look for a video recording of how to access that. Um, I'll post that recording and I'll put an announcement probably next week sometime of just a reminder of how to get to these Physio X labs. And then I'll briefly cover it um, when we're together Tuesday and Thursday nights too. Uh, professor? Yeah. I have a really quick question about the sure. Physio X. Um, you know how uh, for Labster we can, you know, if we can redo it as many times as we want and we it keeps the highest score, does the same apply for Physio X or is it graded differently? Yeah, so pretty much. So with PhysioX, what you'll do is you're going to do the lab simulations and basically create your own lab report by answering the questions. And you're going to download that as a PDF and then submit that PDF document. So you can keep doing those lab simulations and making your lab report as nice as you want before you submit it. Um, and, the, and for those, I will go through and grade them individually. And I usually focus, I'll focus on um, your kind of report summary questions at the end. Okay, thank you. Yep, good question. All right, I'm going to jump right in to chapter nine here. Um, chapter nine is still interesting. Not that the others aren't, um, but the nervous system just gets a little, there's a lot of information coming up in the nervous system. Not to scare you, it's still really interesting, but um, the muscle system is fun. It's all fun. It's all great. Okay, so here we are in muscles and muscle tissue. Um, so some of this will be review from anatomy and these first couple slides, I don't have a whole lot of um, questions about muscle tissue review from anatomy. So um, I'm more focused, questions from this chapter are gonna focus on muscle contraction um, and we'll, we'll get through that. But I'm gonna give you a little brief overview now of muscles and muscle tissue. 
So our muscles make up, um, just letting a couple more people in, nearly half of our body's mass and muscles can transform chemical energy, ATP, into mechanical energy resulting in a force. And when our muscles contract or shorten, that's what pulls on our bones to cause movement of our bones. And the shortening of muscles, the contraction, is that what the part that we're going to dive into and focus on. So a little bit more overview about muscle tissue. Um, we're gonna look a little bit about the types of muscle tissue characteristics and muscle functions. Usually um, muscle words or terminology start with myo, mis, or sarco. So for example, sarcoplasm is the muscle cell cytoplasm. There's three types of muscle tissue. Maybe you remember skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. And only skeletal and smooth muscle cells are elongated and referred to as muscle fibers. Skeletal muscle fibers or skeletal muscle tissue is packaged into skeletal muscles, which are your organs attached to bones and skin. And skeletal muscle fibers are the longest of all the muscle and they have the stripes. They're voluntary or consciously controlled. And that's because you can control when you're moving your skeletal muscles or when you make a facial expression, those are skeletal muscles. They can contract rapidly, but they also tire easily. So they're extremely powerful. The most powerful muscle in your body are your quadriceps muscle. And some key words for skeletal muscle that you should just kind of get ingrained in your head are skeletal, striated or stripes and voluntary. Cardiac muscle is found in the heart. It's also striated, but it is involuntary meaning you do not tell your heart when to beat, which is a good thing. It contracts at a steady rate, but the nervous system can increase your heart rate. And here's some key words to remember for cardiac muscle, cardiac, striated, and involuntary. And then smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of your hollow organs, stomach, urinary bladder. It does not have stripes. It's not striated and it's involuntary as well. So it cannot be controlled consciously. I always tell the story about a woman in a coma who's pregnant, which is a terrible situation, but she, um, you hear stories of women in comas giving birth because their uterus is made of smooth, smooth muscle, so it can involuntary contract. Um, so it's visceral related, meaning it's what makes up the walls of your organs. Viscera means organ, non-striated and involuntary. And probably what I just covered in the first eight slides can be summed up in this chart. And um, this is just a good chart to kind of study those first eight slides. And you don't really need to know more than that. Just, to, just slight differences between each of the three. You should know these characteristics of muscles, um, especially maybe this one. That might be a true and false question on your exam. Uh, so excitability is the ability to receive and respond to stimuli. So this just means that your muscles can respond to nervous stimulation, which is good. Contractility means they have the ability to shorten forcefully when they're stimulated by a nerve. Extensibility, they can be stretched and elasticity, they could recoil back to resting. So you should know those characteristics. Um, for important functions, muscles can produce movement. They maintain your posture and body position. I should work on my posture right now. Um, we all have kind of the tech back of COVID leading over our computers or phones before COVID, we were probably a terrible posture. And they can generate heat when they contract. So your muscles can generate heat. Notice I'm underlining some things. So skeletal muscles in an organ um, are made up of different tissues with three features. They have nerves, they have arteries and veins, so the blood supply. They're covered with connective tissue and they are, have different attachments like tendons or ligaments to bones, um, not ligaments, ligaments attach bone to bones, but they have tendons and other attachments. Um, so here's the nerve and blood supply to muscles. Basically each muscle receives a nerve, an artery and veins. Um, when muscles contract, they require huge amounts of oxygen and nutrients, and they also need waste products to be removed quickly so they don't build up in your muscles. So here are the connected tissue sheaths that surround each muscle and muscle fiber. Um, the connective tissue sheaths will support the cells and reinforce the whole muscle. The sheaths, if we're going from um, superficial to deep or external to internal, the epimesium, so you'll see this kind of suffix or terminology mes in there having to do with muscle. This um, surrounds the entire muscle. The perimesium is fibrous connective tissue surrounding the fascicles, which are groups of muscle fibers. 
And then the endomesium is the connective tissue surrounding each muscle fiber individually. And you can see here how we kind of separate out a muscle. So we have a large muscle um, attached to the bone at the tendon. Within each um, muscle, it's made up of groups of fascicles. And we've kind of pulled out a fascicle right here. This is one fascicle. And then we've pulled out from that fascicle um, a muscle fiber. And a muscle fiber is just another word for a muscle cell. So muscle fiber and muscle cell. So here are ways that muscles attach to bones via the origin and insertion. Um, the insertion is the attachment to the movable bone piece and the origin is the attachment to the immovable or less movable bone. Attachments can be indirect or direct and I won't ask you guys too many questions about that. Yes, um, so, yeah. What constitutes a muscle? Like how many, um, like, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the question will come back. Like, so, what make, I'm sorry, which, what makes each muscle itself? Like how many muscle um, cells do you need in order to make a different muscle? Great question. So our skeletal muscles, for example, are very interesting because they're considered complete organs. And um, so it's a complete organ because it has more than one type of tissue in it. Um, so it has connective tissue, it has nerves, arteries, and veins. So what makes up one single muscle, um, usually it'll just be grouped as a muscle and you'll see the connective tissue of the epimysium around it. So for example, in anatomy, if you remember learning about the biceps, the triceps, the rectus femoris, the pectoralis, the deltoids, um, what makes up each muscle is just that it's all the fascicles and all will run in a similar direction. And there will be like very direct lineages or lines that are bordering it. So that is what makes up like a whole muscle. Um, in terms of like cardiac muscle or smooth muscle, when we talk about those types of muscle, cardiac muscle is just muscle tissue that's found in the heart, the walls of the heart. And then smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of hollow organs. But an actual like skeletal muscle is a complete kind of grouping of fascicles um, that are all kind of in the same direction. And there are usually like an origin an insertion or an attachment to one, like two sides of it. So it's easy to see that it's just one muscle. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. So here's the structure and organization levels of muscles. Um, you can see the whole muscle here usually is attached to a bone by a tendon. It's covered with epimysium. We pull out a fascicle. Um, the fascicle is surrounded by the perimysium from the perimysium. So whole muscles are made up of bundles of fascicles. Fascicles are made of bundles of muscle fibers. And when we pull out a muscle fiber to see what makes up a muscle fiber, remember that one muscle fiber is equal to one muscle cell. So in the muscle fiber, we'll see a nucleus, usually on the periphery. We'll see these bands or striations. And then within the muscle fiber, we'll see sarcolemma. It's covered with an endomesium. And we pull out um, these myofilaments from the muscle fiber. And the myofilaments will be actin and myosin that help the muscle to contract. And, you know, I won't ask you too many questions, but we're gonna focus on the muscle fiber level and what happens even at the myofilament level when the muscle contracts. A little bit of the anatomy of, and of the sliding filament model, you should be familiar with some of these words. So your skeletal muscle fibers, and we're gonna focus kind of this chapter on skeletal muscles and how they contract. I won't ask you guys how cardiac or smooth muscles contract. They contract similarly, but a little different. Um, your skeletal muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells that contain multiple nuclei. The sarcolemma, so we've changed some of our wording here. The sarcolemma refers to the muscle fiber plasma membrane or the cell border or boundary. The sarcoplasm is the muscle fiber cytoplasm. Um, which will contain many glycosomes, which short, store glycogen, um, as well as myoglobin for oxygen storage. There's modify or organelles in um, the muscle fiber. You have myofibrils, 
the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is um, similar to the endoplasmic reticulum, um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum in your muscle fibers stores calcium. Um, that will be a test question. I will ask you what organelle in the muscle fiber cell stores calcium, and it's the sarcoplasmic, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then T tubules are a special organelle that we'll talk about what those are too. So myofibrils are densely packed rod-like elements. Um, myofibrils are made up of myofilaments, but they have striations, they have sarcomeres, which is the functional contracting unit of muscles. They have myofilaments, which are actin and myosin, and we'll look at the molecular composition of those myofilaments. So here's a look again at a muscle fiber showing one myofibril being pulled out. Um, and I misspoke, I called this a myofilament, but the myofibril being pulled out is actually made up of myofilaments, which are the smallest parts, the smallest proteins that make up a muscle. You can see the nucleus, the light and dark bands refer to light and dark regions that make up the striations um, that are created by how the actin and myosin overlap. And we'll talk about that. And there's some mitochondria. So your muscle fibers need lots of energy. They need ATP all the time. And we'll talk about why. The organelle that makes ATP in our cells is mitochondria. So we'll see a ton of mitochondria in muscle cells. So we have stripes or striations formed from the repeating series of dark and light bands. The A bands are the dark regions and the I bands are the light regions. The A bands have an H zone and an M line. Um, the M line is the line of protein that bisects or goes right down the middle of the H zone. And the I band um, is bordered by the Z discs, which are cone-shaped sheets of proteins kind of on a zigzag line. And um, I'm gonna show you kind of a picture of that in a little bit because it'll be easier to tell, but here's a microscopic look at two muscle fibers. And you can see just the different colors of dark and light bands that give muscle fibers the striations. And we'll talk about some of those regions that I named a little more. So a sarcomere itself is the smallest contractile unit or the functional unit of a muscle fiber. So your muscle fibers are made up of millions of sarcomeres put together to cause it to contract. But one sarcomere is one functional unit of the muscle fiber. It contains the A band with half of an I band at each end. I'll just show you pictures of what that means. And individual sarcomeres aligned end to end along a myofibril, much like boxcars of a chain. So here's a sarcomere. This is the functional unit of muscle fiber contraction. So this is one sarcomere. And as we look at the sarcomere, the Z disc borders the beginning of one sarcomere to the next. So sarcomeres are bordered by the Z discs, which are those zigzag lines that go down the middle. And then you see the H zone, which kind of goes down the middle of the sarcomere. We see the A band is the darker colored band. And that's because you can kind of see within the A band, it's made up of these kind of thicker red uh, myofilaments. And those thick myofilaments are the myosin. And then the I band, it's a lot lighter in color because it doesn't have those thick myosin filaments. It only has these really thin blue lines, which correspond to your actin or thin myofilaments. Um, so those are some microscopic features of skeletal muscles. Um, I don't think on your exam, I might have one question about, you know, what's the I band, A, A band, but I don't focus too much on knowing the exact details of what makes up the I band or A band. you should know what myofilaments are. They are the orderly arrangement of actin and myosin. And actin and myosin are the two myofilaments that you should know well. Actin is thin. It extends across the I band, partway into the A band, and it's always anchored to the Z discs. And you can see here, these are the actin um, filaments anchored to the Z discs. The myosin myo myofilaments are thick and they extend the length of the A band, which again was the dark region. And they are connected at the M line, which goes right down the middle. And the sarcomere, again, cross section just shows their arrangement of them. So here's the sarcomere arrangement. The enlargement of one sarcomere is shown at the top. You can see the Z discs. And I really like this 
view of um, the sarcomere a lot better because it kind of shows you, and that's a terrible line, sorry. It shows you that the sarcomere is a Z-disc to a Z-disc. And then it shows you kind of how the actin and myosin line up, but it shows you what they look like. So these myosin, these thick filaments, they are kind of, they look like a bunch of golf clubs bound together. You can see the little heads of the golf clubs and they're all bound together. The M line goes down the middle. And then the actin myofilaments, if you look closely, they look like um, two strings of beads that are kind of round, are wound on top, wound around each other. And you can see again in different parts of the sarcomere, if we would take a cross section, what would make up each section. So again, the I band is lighter colored, that's only thin bands. The H zone is thick filaments. The M line is the thick filaments with accessory proteins. And then the outer edge of the A band is where they overlap. And again, you guys don't really need to know all of that, but I like this picture to show you how a sarcomere is made up. And it's important to kind of remember this picture in your head as we talk more about muscle contraction, because how your muscles contract or shorten, the two Z discs come together and the actin and myosin myofilaments will just slide past each other to cause the muscle to shorten. And that's what muscle contraction is. And we will go in and talk about how it shortens and those actin and myosin slide past each other. So here's some more molecular composition of these myofilaments. And it's important to cover this first because then we'll talk about, we're learning the structure right now of the myofilaments and then we'll learn how they function together to cause muscle contraction. So your thick filaments are composed of the protein myosin. Um, it contains heavy and light chains which basically looks like golf clubs coming together. Um, the head of the golf club and then the tail is the longer region. During muscle contraction, what happens is the heads of the myosin will link the thick and filaments together causing what we call a cross bridge. So basically what happens is the head of the myosin will come up and attach to your actin to, to, crop, to cause a bridge or a cross bridge. Um, actin then is a polypeptide protein made up of kidney shaped G actin subunits. Um, G actin subunits will link together to form long fibrous F actin strings. Um, two of these F actin strands are what you see as that twisting together. This is the big one that you should know. So along with the actin myo, myo actin myofilament, uh, along with the actin, it contains what we call tropomyosin and troponin, which are regulatory proteins bound to actin. And you should understand well what tropomyosin are and troponin are. They're the two proteins that will be working together with actin in muscle contraction. So here's a great picture of what I just talked about where here are the thick filaments. So this is myosin. Here's one myosin mo molecule with the um, head and the tail. And you can see how multiple heads and tails come together to form all of these, this thick myosin myofilament with all the heads sticking out. What happens is all those heads have actin binding sites on them. So this is where you can kind of see it's shaded a little bit darker. On those heads, those heads of the myosin will attach to the actin at those actin binding sites. Another important part of the head is the ATP binding site. And this is important because ATP is required for the heads to actually detach and stop muscle contraction. So if you don't have ATP, your muscles will remain contracted the whole time. And this is what happens at death, what we call rigor mortis and the stiffening of the body at death because there's no ATP or energy um, to detach these heads from the actin and they remain contracted. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that too. So here's the portion of the thin filament. Again, the thin filament looks like these two strands of beads wound around each other. But what also is important here are the two proteins I mentioned, troponin and tropomyosin. Troponin are these yellow shaped um, proteins that are attached kind of every once in a while along the actin. And then the tropomyosin are these long spaghetti-like strands what the tropomyosin are doing, if you look closely, they're covering up these little shaded regions. And those little shaded regions are the myosin head binding sites. And if we zoom in 
on these little pearls that act in subunits. You can see those little shaded regions on each subunit, and those are where the myosin head will bind or form a cross bridge to the actin. And the tropomyosin, when your muscles are not contracting, will cover up all of those myosin binding sites. So that's a thin filament. Other molecular composition, what else makes up some of our myofilaments? We have the elastic filament, titan, holds thick filaments in place. Um, dystrophin links thin filaments to the proteins. And then we have other proteins that I won't ask you too much questions about. A homeostatic imbalance, you might have heard of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a common, serious form of muscular dystrophies. It destroys muscles. It appears in childhood. It's usually a sex-linked recessive disease, which means it's, um, it's, it almost occurs exclusively in males. And it appears between two and seven years old. Oftentimes the common signs are um, boys will become clumsy. They might fall. You'll notice poor muscle tone in their legs. The disease can progress um, from the extremities upward, finally affecting the head, chest muscles, and cardiac muscles. So the cardiac muscle, the heart will eventually stop. But with supportive care, um, people with um, muscular dystrophy can live into their 30s and beyond. It's caused by a defective gene for the dystrophin, um, which that dystrophin um, helps to stabilize the sarcolemma. In these patients, the sarcolemma will tear easily, allowing for too many calcium ions to come in and damage the contractile fibers. So you have inflammation following and regenerative capacity is lost, resulting in just an increased apoptosis of your muscle cells and they just get a lot weaker. Um, no cure for it yet. I went to school with a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, thankfully he lived to be, I think, 30 years old. He went on to graduate college, had a job. Um, so I think, you know, today you can live a lot longer, 30s and beyond, but um, no cure yet for that. Okay, let's get more into muscles now. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's a network of smooth endoplasmic reticulum fibers or tubules surrounding each myofibril. It runs longitudinally and the terminal cisterns, kind of the endings of them, form perpendicular cross channels at the AI band in the sarcomere. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum functions in regulation of intracellular calcium levels. And this is the big one. Sarcoplasmic reticulum stores and releases calcium during muscle contraction. And so you, we need calcium to be released during muscle contraction. And we'll talk about why. When our muscles aren't contracting, the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores it. So I cannot emphasize that enough. If you're listening, you got another question right on your exam. Sarcoplasmic reticulum stores and releases calcium. T tubules are tubes formed by the protrusion of the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma, remember, is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. And a tube, the T tubule, kind of goes into the cell interior to increase the muscle fiber surface area. The lumen is continuous with extracellular space. And this allows for the electrical nerve transmission to reach deep into the muscle fiber. Because in order for our muscles to contract, we first need to stimulate them with a nerve or a nervous response. Um, the tubules will penetrate the cell's interior at this AI band junction between the terminal, cistern, terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we form what we call a triad, three pieces. This is the area formed from the terminal cistern of one sarcomere, so coming from one end, the T tubule going down the middle, and the terminal cistern of the neighboring sarcomere. So what we're getting here, and let's see if we can kind of show a picture, and then I'll talk a little more. So in dark blue are the sarcoplasmic reticulum and this terminal cisterns where they end. And then in light blue is the T tubule. And kind of right here, this area is called a triad. What happens is um, in electrical impulse and action potential will travel down the T tubule. And when it does that, it'll tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium. And when the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we will start the um, contraction of a muscle. Um, so this more talks about the T tubule, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then when an electrical impulse passes by, the T tubule proteins change shape, which will again cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum proteins to change shape. 
which again will release calcium into the cytoplasm or into the cell, the muscle fiber cell. So contraction, and we're not gonna get through the whole PowerPoint tonight. If you joined us late, my plan for uh, these next couple of weeks is if we don't finish a um, PowerPoint right away, what I'll do is I might do a separate recording of it for you to finish watching that chapter so we can keep moving. Um, but I'll do those recordings the same way I'm doing this now. I'll talk through everything and I'll add in my special hints. So contraction. And again, what you guys need to know for the lecture exam for this chapter is going to focus a lot on the events of contraction, the events of st stimulate, stimulating a nerve muscle fiber and knowing the process of that. So contraction is the activation of cross bridges to generate force. And the cross bridges just mean that the myosin heads are forming a bridge or connecting to the actin. So that's what contraction is. We wanna form that connection so that the actin and the myosin can slide past each other and shorten the sarcomere. This shortening occurs when tension generated by cross bridges on thin filaments exceeds the forces opposing them and contraction ends when the cross bridge detaches or becomes inactive. In the relaxed state, thin and thick filaments overlap only slightly, and the sliding filament model of contraction states that during contraction of muscle fibers, thin filaments slide past thick filaments, causing the actin and myosin again to overlap more. Neither filaments ever change shape, so they never change shape, they just overlap more. So when they overlap, that's what actually causes the sarcomere to shorten. When the nervous system stimulates the muscle fiber, myosin heads are allowed to bind or connect to actin, forming that cross bridge, which causes the sliding or contraction processes to begin. And this is what happens with a cross bridge. The cross bridge attaches, will form and break several times, each time pulling thin filaments a little closer towards the center of the sarcomere and kind of like a ratcheting action. So it's not necessarily a smooth sliding. It's kind of like a bump, bump, bump sliding. And this causes the shortening of the muscle fiber. These are how um, each kind of area of the sarcomere changes shape. And I don't ask you guys specifically how each area changes shape. So this is a fully relaxed sarcomere of a muscle fiber. You can see here that in the A zone, um, the myosin and actin are slightly overlapped. And by overlapped, I mean this section. It means actin and myosin are next to each other, but they're not touching. In the I zone, it's only actin. And in the H zone, it's only myosin. But this is a fully relaxed sarcomere. And it's fun to see the micrograph of the fully relaxed sarcomere above too. So if we change this then to the fully contracted sarcomere. So I'm going to show you this one more time. This is fully relaxed and then fully contracted. We kind of lose a lot of our color because everything has kind of shortened and come together. What we see here is the um, length of the myofilaments haven't changed at all, but you can notice that the Z disc, so fully relaxed, contracted, the Z discs have come together, and that's because the actin and myosin have slid past each other. And again, the sliding past of actin and myosin, because they form those cross bridges, they're connected, they, that forms the contraction, the sliding filament model, and that's what causes your muscles to contract, which cause your bones to move. So muscle fiber contraction, a little bit about the background. Um, your decision to move is activated by your brain, which means you guys control when your skeletal muscles move. The signal is transmitted down your spinal cord to a motor neuron, which will be a specific nerve coming from the spinal cord, which will then activate the muscle fiber. These motor neurons and muscle cells are excitable cells that are capable of action potential. So that means these excitable cells are capable of changing their resting membrane voltage. Resting membrane voltage means that the voltage just means that the inside, right inside the membrane of your skeletal muscle fibers, they're, they're like electrically charged. When we change that electrical charge or voltage, that's what causes them to be stimulated or an electric current to run through. The action potential, which is the transmission of this electrical current from a neuron, which is a nerve, to a muscle cell, um, happens always with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, 
or ACH, and we'll talk about how that happens. We also need to talk about what ion channels are. These play the major role in the changing of the membrane potential or the change in electrical charge. You have two classes of ion channels. You have some that are chemically gated, so that are only opened by chemical messengers like a neurotransmitter. And we're talking about muscle cells. So on muscle cells, they, they will have receptors for acetylcholine. So when the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds, these will open these channels. Voltage gated channels open and close in response to a voltage change when the electrical charge changes in the membrane potential. And this will make more sense when I go through it. So these are the two differences. We have a chemically gated channel and you can see that they have the ability to bind to a chemical messenger like acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, or a voltage gated channel which will just become open when there's a change in voltage in the membrane. So the anatomy of motor neurons and the neuromuscular junction. You should know well the anatomy of the motor neurons at the neuromuscular junction. So your skeletal muscles, our skeletal muscles, are stimulated to contract by what we call somatic motor neurons. Maybe you, that name sounds familiar, and if not, it's okay. A somatic neuron has to do with skeletal muscles, and axons are long thread-like extensions of motor neurons that travel from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle. Each axon divides into many branches and it enters the muscle. Axon branches end on one specific muscle fiber, forming the neuromuscular junction, which is just a fancy way of saying the junction between the neuron and the muscle. So neuromuscular junction, it's when the two come together. We also call this the motor end plate, and each muscle fiber has one neuromuscular junction with one motor neuron. So this is what I mean by this. When you wanna move your hand to send someone a text, that impulse comes down from the brain and then through a motor neuron that has a cell body, an axon, and then axon terminals. Here's the axon of the motor neuron and showing the axon terminals on one muscle fiber. So each kind of branch of an axon will go to one muscle fiber and the neuromuscular junction is the region where the motor neuron will contact or touch a skeletal muscle fiber. It consists of multiple axon terminals and all the underlying junctional folds of the sarcolemma. So the axon terminal, which is the end of each axon that's coming um, to innervate a muscle fiber and a muscle fiber are always separated just a little bit by a space filled with gel called the synaptic cleft. And stored with the axon terminals are what we call synaptic vesicles. And these vesicles are what contain the neurotransmitter, which is what we need, acetylcholine. Infoldings of the sarcolemma, and remember the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber, are called junctional folds, and they contain lots of receptors to bind to those acetylcholine. NMJ stands for neuromuscular junction. So that consists of the axon terminals, the synaptic cleft, the junctional folds. And I'll talk about what that looks like here. So this is a great picture. You might find a picture like this on your exam that you'll have to label. One of the favorite matching questions that I like to use, which some of you might like. I think you like matching questions when you know the answers. You probably don't like them when you don't know any. But um, you have a question labeling a picture like this. This is the neuromuscular junction and um, knowing all the parts that are lab labeled because it shows the axon of the motor neuron coming down. And you can see that the synaptic cleft is the space between the axon terminal and the sarcolemma or the muscle fiber cell. You see junctional folds of the sarcolemma, which are just folds within the plasma membrane. And right here, are the um, receptors for the acetylcholine, the transmitter. So what happens here in the axon, you'll see mitochondria, you'll see these synaptic vesicles with the acetylcholine. And what they will eventually do is they're going to spit out or exocytose their acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine are the neurotransmitters that are right here that will travel across the cleft and bind to these chemically gated ion channels.
And that's what kind of transmits the signal coming down from your nervous system. That's what changes it from a nerve impulse then to a muscle impulse. It's really the acetylcholine neurotransmitters being released, stimulating these chemically gated channels that then starts the muscle fiber to be stimulated. So here, the, I like this slide because it gives you the big picture, um, the four basic steps for skeletal muscles to contract. And again, this chapter, I mean, this is where I ask the majority of your questions, knowing and understanding these four basic steps. You should know what happens at the neuromuscular junction. First, when a muscle fiber gets stimulated by a neuron, muscle fiber excitation. So how does exactly a muscle fiber get excited with that nervous response or an action potential? You should know the excitation contraction coupling, what that means, how we turn your muscle fiber being excited with an electrical signal, and how do we turn that into the muscle actually contracting? And then the cross bridge cycling, which refers to myosin binding to actin and then releasing. That's kind of kind of goes in a cycle. So this is actually a great slide that um, I, I don't know if you could answer all the questions on the test just by studying this one slide. But this slide would be a great one maybe to start your studying with because it gives you all the events of those four big picture items um, one at a time. And then we'll go into detail more about it, but it includes pictures with it. So. Come back to this slide when you're studying that and that'll hopefully help a little bit. So here are the events at the neuromuscular junction and action potential, which again, when we say an action potential, we mean kind of an electrical signal or a stimulus will arrive at the axon terminal. So the end of the neuron, that action potential causes calcium channels to open and calcium enters the motor neuron. And what calcium is responsible for is it causes the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And that's a really important step because acetylcholine is what will travel across the synaptic cleft and it will bind to the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber cells. So acetylcholine is kind of uh, the messenger to connect our neuron to our muscle cell. The acetylcholine binding to the receptor opens gates, which allow sodium to enter, and sodium entering results, results in end plate potential. What that means is when we have these positive sodium ions rush into the muscle cell, that changes the potential or the electrical voltage of the membrane, and we call that end plate potential. We can't leave acetylcholine um, in the synaptic cleft forever because acetylcholine will cause your muscles to contract continuously. So we have a special enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which degrades acetylcholine or moves acetylcholine uh, back into the, um, to the neuron axon terminal. So you should know what acetylcholine does specifically to acetylcholine esterase. So here are the steps going one at a time. I like these slides because they take you through one at a time with pictures. We're looking right here and action potentials arriving at the axon terminal of a motor neuron. This means that your brain is telling your um, biceps to flex. So the brain, the, the, the signal is coming down. Step two, voltage gated calcium channels open and calcium enters the axon terminal. Calcium entry causes acetylcholine to be released by exocytosis across the synaptic cleft. And we're right here. This is your synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine is being released. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma. Acetylcholine binding will open chemically gated ion channels that allows the simultaneous passage of sodium into the cell. When sodium enters the cell, potassium exits. As more and more sodium enters and potassium exits, this causes a local change in membrane potential because we're changing the charge inside the cell because we're flooding the inside of the cell with a positive charge. So the charge inside the cell will change. And this is called end plate potential. Sodium and potassium moving in and out of cells to cause this difference in electrical um, potential we see this in muscle cells and we'll also see it in nerve, nerve cells too. Acetylcholine effects will be terminated or ended by its breakdown in the synaptic cleft by acetylcholine esterase. 
which will be the enzyme that degrades it. And they, an acetylcholine also diffuses away from the junction so that we're not constantly stimulating this muscle fiber. Um, we have many toxins. So this is where a lot of toxins, poisons, drugs, diseases, specifically interfere with effects at this neuromuscular junction. So for example, myasthenia gravis is characterized by droopy upper eyelids, difficulty swallowing and talking, muscle weakness. And this involves a shortage of acetylcholine receptors. So you don't have the acetylcholine receptors that you need because the person's acetylcholine receptors are actually being attacked by the body's own antibodies. And whenever your body attacks itself, that's what calls or constitutes an autoimmune disease. So if you don't have acetylcholine receptors, you never get your muscle fibers to basically contract and be stimulated. All right, we'll go a little bit farther and then I'll pause for tonight and I'll finish it in another recording that I'll post. Um, the resting sarcolemma is what we call polarized, meaning there is a voltage across the membrane. That just means that at all times, your muscle cells, there's a voltage along the membrane. They're ready to be like activated. That's what means they're, they can be excitable or activated by a nervous impulse. It's important to remember that the inside of a muscle fiber cell is always negative compared to the outside. And an action potential will be caused when we change the electrical charges. And an action potential means that we're sending a signal down that cell. These are the three steps to create an action potential in the sarcolemma um, of a muscle cell. End plate potential exists when the acetylcholine released from motor neurons binds to the acetylcholine receptors. This is what causes chemically gated ion channels to open and sodium always diffuses into the muscle fiber and potassium moves out. And because sodium moves in, it takes its positive charge with it. So if, we, if a muscle cell gets a lot of sodium positively charged, the inside of the cell becomes more positive, and this is called local depolarization or end plate potential. So this is end plate potential that's generated when sodium moves in to the muscle fiber cell. Depolarization then is actually the generation and propagation of an action potential. So once we've created this end plate potential, depolarization means then we'll pass on, the, pass on this action potential to all parts of the muscle. Um, that if the end plate potential causes enough change um, to reach what we call threshold, voltage gate in sodium channels will open and even more sodium enters triggering an action potential that's basically unstoppable and lead to a muscle fiber contraction. And this action potential will then spread across the sarcolemma um, from one voltage gated channel to the next um, to cause depolarization throughout the muscle fiber. So here's the generating and propagating of an action potential with depolarization we have um, open voltage gated channels opening and the action potential will travel along the membrane. Repolarization just means that we are gonna restore um, the muscle fiber back to normal resting conditions. Your sodium channels close, potassium channels open. And when potassium channels open, potassium goes out of the cell, um, bringing the membrane voltage back to resting. So your cell goes back to resting. The refractory period um, refers to the muscle fiber where it cannot be stimulated for a specific amount of time until repolarization is complete. And this refractory period is good is because it gives your muscles a chance to rest before being stimulated again. Um, and then ionic conditions are restored through what we call the sodium potassium pump. If you're totally confused and lost right now, the same thing will happen in neurons and we'll cover this when we get to your nervous system. So you'll get to hear about it again. So here are the three steps, the summary of events in the generation and propagation of an action potential. And again, big picture, this is how, you remember acetylcholine bound to receptors. And then we wanted to propagate the signal down the muscle cell. And this is what that is describing. This describes what happens when sodium channels open, we get what we call depolarization. So the inside of the cell becomes more positive and that's why we're at this positive 30. And then repolarization occurs when sodium channels close, potassium opens, 
and potassium exits. So we go back into repolarization or back to resting membrane potential. So maybe I will stop there and I'll do a recording of the rest. Um, if you're still with me, I created a quick poll. Oh, and some of you have been answering it. It's been on the screen at all times. Have you guys been able to see my screen? Professor, I saw the poll um, with the questions, but I accidentally clicked X because I thought it was a recording in session. Do you want to continue or not? Is it possible you could post those questions up again? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and post, and it only allows me to share the results, but I'm glad you guys moved out of your screen so it wasn't in there. I had um, put it up before I started the chat to make sure it worked, and I never stopped it. So I don't know if you guys can answer it anymore because I just shared it, but Let's just go through these questions um, of the following muscle types, which is the only one subject to conscious control. That's your skeletal, meaning that's the one you can control. It's voluntary. Which of the following muscular function serves as a metabolic function? And I didn't talk about this a whole lot, but when you think of metabolic, it has to be something that is like a chemical reaction. Metabolic means um, taking food and creating energy. And the only one that might do that would be generating heat. And I include heat generation, not because you'll need to know that it's part of the metabolic function, but you should know that your skeletal muscles can generate heat. The thin filaments are not comprised of which of the following, and that's titan. Titan was a protein associated with myosin, but your thin filaments have troponin, tropomyosin, and actin. What's calcium's function? Ooh, this one, I, you know, we didn't really get to calcium yet, so... Um, if you're wondering about this one, and if you're wondering what the quest answer is, um, calcium will bind to troponin, changing its shape, removing the blocking action of tropomyosin. So the first answer is right. I'm surprised how many of you got that because we haven't even touched that yet. All these questions I took are from the review questions on, that are listed under this PowerPoint. So the right answers are in there too. Let's see if we went through this one yet. At the neuromuscular junction, the muscle contraction initiation event is the first thing that happens. And basically the only one we talked about so far is the binding of acetylcholine. So that's kind of as far as we got in this part. We just talked about how acetylcholine needs to bind. And then these next steps we'll talk about in the kind of part two. Depolarization, the sarcolemma is most permeable to sodium because sodium is what enters during depolarization. So for me not getting through the whole um, lecture tonight, that was pretty good. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.